Good morning. I'm Ken Bibberay, and welcome to Coffee with Ken, a thought leadership series at the nexus of business and politics. Today's topic is empowering the clean energy future, and we're joined by Phil Kangas, the Director of Outreach and Business Development for the Department of Energy's Loan Program Office. Phil, great to see you again. Yeah, thanks. Good to be here. Well, look, I mean, let's take it at a high level, right? I mean, you spent a couple of decades in management consulting, you're kind of doing the business thing, and now here you are, you are smack dab in the middle of government in a very high profile role with a ton of resources at your disposal to basically solve the climate problem. So no pressure, Phil, but, but how's it going? (laughs) Well, thanks very much. And, and, you know, again, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here talking to you, but even more thrilled to have made this career transition and now to be on this side of the conference room table. I spent decades, you know, working for government clients, working for energy clients, and now to actually be part of that team, you know, in this office that's really focused on deployment, couldn't be more exciting. And, Hopefully we can get into that a little bit too, yeah. but but truly, you know, as you think about the, the life cycle of change from research and development to demonstration of a project to actually then deploying it, where does the steel actually get into the ground? This is the office in the Department of Energy that's positioned to fund that kind of uh, that kind of change and that kind of uh, investment for the American public and for the world, really. Um, so really thrilled to be here and to be part of this all star team. So, so let's let's kind of level set here, right? Like the LPO has existed for a while, obviously, but in the in the aftermath of the Inflation Reduction Act, this is really kind of the office to help with, as you said, the implementation of these resources. Kind of help size it up for us, right? Like we we were lucky enough to have Jigger Shaw, the head of the office, like a year and a half ago, right? And that was I feel so early, but it feels like between him coming in the fall of twenty two and and today, a lot has changed uh, over at LPO. So maybe give us a kind of landscape of where you feel. Yeah. The magnitude of what you're trying to do and the resources behind it. Absolutely. And maybe just as to, to take a step back, you're right, the LPO has been in existence for a while, right? It was created in 2005 um, uh, in the Energy Policy Act and under a Republican administration, I would add, and it was designed really to make investments in, in energy transformation. And through the course of the ensuing you know, decade, really became dormant. And it was called out as much by Secretary Granholm in her um, you know, confirmation hearings. And so that was one of her priorities was to get mm-hmm. this resuscitated in many ways and to have Jigger come in with his leadership and his background and his network. He's done a ton to really galvanize uh, a team of experts and uh, superstars, <laughs> no, uh, truly folks who have come from the energy space, who know project finance, and have come together to create a real interest and enthusiasm for our authorities. Now, along the way, the, as you say, the, the, um, the bipartisan infrastructure law passed, the IRA passed, and that turned what we had, which was essentially a $40 billion uh, lending authority uh, to some would say almost 400 billion, right? I mean, we have a credit subsidy, so it's a little tricky in doing the math, but importantly, each of our programs was enhanced, both in terms of our lending authority and the scope of those programs. Mm-hmm. Meaning, and so what we've seen then, as you look back over the past, say, couple of years, is a pipeline of opportunities, a pipeline of interest that has grown from, gosh, pick a point in time. I mean, we, we just, uh, I think about a year ago, we had maybe half of this as much, but now we've just crossed... In, the, in our December monthly activity report, two important milestones, $200 billion wow. in applications uh, in the pipeline and over 200 separate applications. And these are these are not small projects, right? I mean, 200 may not seem like a lot, lot of numbers of applications, but each of our applications yep. really runs, you know, no less than about $100 million in size. And again, our average is much closer to a billion dollar in size uh, because the process behind lending here at the loan programs office is complex, right? These are real dollars uh, that we're lending. So they have to be done thoughtfully. And the stewardship model that we have in protecting taxpayer dollars builds in a lot of due diligence along the way. So we know that there's a reasonable prospect of repayment. We know that there are offtake agreements. We test the markets, we test the technology. And so, um, so where we're at today versus maybe where Jigger was when he joined you a year ago um, is is really a, uh, an exciting time because we have this interest now and our team is pivoting in, in an important way to really now look at how do we close these deals? How do we take an application all the way to you know a funded loan? Um, happy to step through that if, if you're interested. But yeah, uh, I, I think, think 
I think at a high level, it'd be helpful, right? Like if, you, yeah. if you're on the West Coast and you're innovating a new battery technology or a new solar plan, right? Like people are hearing about this. So I imagine part of your role is like half motivating people to apply for loans, but also half like educating people on the process and why they should and what the kind of hurdles are. And, you yeah. know, as you mentioned, it, it's a big process to apply for, for a loan, right? You don't just fill it out. <laughs> on the internet right like it know. is yeah that's right i mean don't think it's one sitting you know <laughs> <laughs> the online application so um and and maybe i'll start by just sort of describing sort of where we where i come to the process to, to the process so my team in outreach and business development has the responsibility to have consultations with interested parties and so we've built a team uh, around our program authorities so we have four key programs uh, in our in our department, right? So, um, ATVM, which is the Advanced Vehicle Technology Manufacturing Program, Title Seventeen, which is Energy Supply Chain Energy mm -hmm. Innovation, that now also includes Subtitle Seventeen O Six. Love government <laughs> names for things, um, which is Energy Infrastructure re um, Retooling um, and Repowering. Um, and then we have a tribal program focused on Native American communities. Mm -hmm. And then uh, CIFIA, which is carbon uh, trans tr transportation. Mm -hmm. Now, the largest of those programs is under Title 17, which is right. energy innovation, energy supply chain. And within that program, there's a two part sort of evaluation at the beginning. So our team meets with an interested applicant, and we have on our website an intake process where you could reach out to us. We'll connect you to someone who works on that team and who works in the, that technology space. But we go through first an eligibility discussion, right? We need to see that the applicant is actually qualified for one of our loans, right? So we look at, you know, is it one of the eligible technologies that we have identified? Does it meaningfully reduce greenhouse gas? Does it create jobs in the United States? And does it have, and is it part of a comprehensive business plan that will um, ultimately, you know, show a, a, a meaningful impact on the community in which it would mm -hmm. be placed, right? So those are some of the key initial eligibility requirements. Uh, we do need to know where the application is going to be, where the, the technology investment will be located so we can be thinking about an um, uh, environmental review through NEPA. Um, so those are some of the baselines. Um, once we determine that it is eligible, then we look at, is it would it be viable, right? And so mm -hmm. we'll look at, you know, is there a reasonable prospect of repayment and how do we decide that? We look at, you know, offtake agreements, uh, whether the contracts are in place, is there a, a feed study um, where the, we actually see documented, um, you know, the engineering model to see that it would actually indu indeed work? Um, we look at the the <coughs> optakers, you know, their their um, credit standing. Um, you know, we look at uh, other risks and financial metrics, so mm -hmm. that then feel like it can actually get through our due diligence process. And this is important because up to this point, and this has been an improvement that's been made. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, before I got here, but um, but it, during, under this administration, we don't charge for the applicant for any of the these this review to this stage okay. or gets to the due diligence phase. So as as it then moves into due diligence, there is a requirement to do some further um, the market analysis, right? So our team will help identify and engage outside uh, market advisors to test whether or not this actually is some of the assumptions we've made are valid yeah. and the costs associated with those are borne by the applicant sure. and so at the due diligence phase we don't we only want to enter due diligence where we know there's a pretty good chance that that money will be a good investment for the applicant yeah. and so and and at that point too we want to know that we can move forward pretty swiftly through that process and swiftly appreciate is a relative mm -hmm. term because the due diligence um, uh, analysis does take some time mm -hmm. um, Again, the, the, that's a couple million dollars of investment. So, sure. so because of that, we normally would not see loans less than about a hundred million dollars. The math yeah. just doesn't work, you know, yeah. or, or a potential uh, inv investor. So, or or innovator. So it gets through the uh, due diligence, you know, process, and through that process, uh, we would then feel comfortable enough to make a conditional uh, commitment. And mm -hmm. at that at, at that point, um, we do make you know the announcement. We've got a, a conditional commitment in place. Uh, there may be some conditions um, precedent uh, precedent. So we, we have some some uh, final requirements before we get to final close 
and then move it into our, our PMD, our uh, portfolio management division. That's great. So that process, my team in outreach and business development, you know, has a, a, a seat sort of uh, next to the applicant is there sort of like advisor is helping them understand okay. the process at the due diligence phase. Um, we actually hand over the sort of the deal to one of our colleagues in origination. Sure. Uh, origination team kind of is the, the financial expert who takes them through, yeah. you know, applicant through um, the process. We're also supported uh, very well by our technical team or technical and environmental team and our uh, risk management team who also look at these elements to say, it, does this technology work? Is this the right investment for the American taxpayer? What are the risks and how do we, you know, how do we manage or, or um, you know, build in the controls to to make sure that we get the, the, the loans repaid? So, so what I've noticed in helping clients and then folks who are innovators looking to kind of go through this process is, is it's not only intended to be loans to give them the capital to manufacture and create their product, but there's also ancillary kind of priorities around DOE disadvantaged communities, tribal lands, um, economic benefits, community benefits, right? Talk a little bit about that, right? Yeah. Because I feel like that's a really important large part of the implementation of this, right? The geography of these energy programs, to me, what I think is is kind of an untold story is the geography yeah. is broad, right? Like if it was in the past and it was a solar project or a wind project or an oil gas project, there's certain geographies you have to go to. With, with this type of manufacturing, it feels like the entire continental United States is, is available uh, to kind of compete for them, right? So it, it all, all of a sudden feels like communities that maybe couldn't yeah. get transformation well, past it, can now. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll maybe take a, um, answer that in a couple of ways. So yeah. absolutely, the communities are part of this equation. And so part of our loan uh, application requirements are uh, the completion of a robust community benefits plan. So how does the investment actually you know, benefit the surrounding communities. It's it's an extension beyond just our normal analysis of the NEPA review, right? The sure. NEPA is the, um, you know, the National Environmental Policy Act, and there are requirements under NEPA to make sure that um, that we have looked at the environmental impact, uh, some of the community impact, um, both from construction and operation to even decommissioning. Um, but the community benefits plan would also include how does the you know the local labor uh, community get get engaged? Are there is there a creation of quality jobs? We've always had the requirement for Davis Bacon wages to be paid through construction um, uh, and execution, but then also you know are we creating not just you know baseline you know uh, a baseline set of wages, but are they quality jobs? Yeah. Are, is there an acknowledgement of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Um, is there an environmental justice dynamic that we can address? And through the Biden administration's Justice 40 initiative, we're, mm -hmm. we're looking at the investments made and wanting to see that at least 40 percent of the benefits do accrue to disadvantaged communities, that we need to show um, accountability for those for that execution. And it's not just a promise in the planning stage and the application stage, but then it becomes also part of the reporting uh, in the portfolio management um, portion. So we actually have some accountability on, on the mm -hmm. back. Um, so, yeah. Well, yeah, so it just in terms of how we're engaging those communities is absolutely important. Um, you asked, though, too, about, you know, some of your viewers might be interested in um, from a, a development's, uh, uh, a developer's perspective, what are some of the key considerations? Often, you know, LPO doesn't influence, you know, the selects, the site selection. Those often come to us by the applicant. Um, some of the, the key considerations, though, might be particularly for manufacturing, you know, um, for larger projects, they may choose a greenfield. But if it's a if it's a retooling or redevelopment, you actually may be better off uh, investing uh, in, a, in a brownfield or redeveloping an existing abandoned plant. Uh, we've definitely seen that um, with a number of our applicants, you know, because those brownfields will probably have legacy access to power and, and utility availability um, are largely are located in in communities where there is an available workforce that may just need to have a reskilled uh, reskilling investment um, logistics considerations, you know, port rail shipping um, and then to proximity to some of the off takers or, the, you know, or the feedstock, you know, it's it's finding those investments to connect. Maybe where a disconnection had happened in the past, 
to repurpose that vehicle, uh, I'm sorry, that location, and that that becomes a more attractive uh, uh, site. Um, Mm -hmm. Those are the type of considerations I know our applicants are making. A lot of those, though, a lot of those analyses have really happened before they come to us. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, because they're coming packaged up and then you're doing the review on the sites they've included. That's that's right. Yeah, that's right. Talk, Talk a little bit about the kind of results over the last kind of year and a half in terms of geography and diversity of projects, right? Like, you know, are you pleasantly surprised, shocked, looking to do more? Like, you know, where are they falling yeah. in various buckets? And where ge- geographically? I mean, it seems like when you look at these reports that they're all over the country. I mean, clearly there's a, a battery belt being developed now in, in the United States and the Southeast, but I I'll tell you that. About distribution, I guess. Yeah, that's really been one of the things I've been most surprised in mm-hmm. within my six months here is just the... Um, <laughs> the truly democratic uh, appeal, I think, of this program, because we have seen almost, I think it's in every state now, uh, an, an applicant, an applicant's interest in it, in making an investment. So it's not just like it's a, it's a coastal, you know, in, interest or just in the Midwest. We really have seen a, a really solid balance and growth in that sort of footprint um, across mm-hmm. sectors. Uh, our monthly activity report, again, you know, at the top line has been re- had really shown some impressive growth and, and is continuing actually to show even uh, a higher curve in that growth, I think, because of the growing interest in one of our latest, you know, its authorities, which is appealing to utilities under 1706, the, the, um, the uh, infrastructure reinvestment. But um, but it has been gratifying to see, you know, both red states and blue benefit mm-hmm. from these investments and those jobs are being created in those in in, in states across the United States. Yes. And I would also say across sectors, you know, we we um, we don't really take a, a specific interest in any sector. That's not really our role is to sort of say, well, we really want to drive money into this or that sector. Um, the one consideration, though, is, you know, at some point these sectors become bankable you know mm-hmm. and solar and wind is a good example right that may have been keenly in our in our crosshairs 10 or 15 years ago but now that those that those yeah. solutions are so well proven um there's available wall street you know money for those right and that's not the space where we want to be in right we want to fill our, our, the purpose this is again why I really i'm so excited to be here in this office because i think it's just good policy Government plays a role where market where markets fail, right? Where markets won't act, and so many of our applicants are first of a kind, second of a of a kind technology. So they need an office like ours to provide the lending, a piece of their of their capital stack in terms of how they're actually going to get to commercialization. So getting them across that bridge to bankability is our purpose. But when the solution is bankable, um, we, we we shouldn't be in that space, right? We don't sure. need to space. And so, you know, from a taxpayer perspective, you know, we would want to be leaning into those riskier areas, not in the, in the safe areas. Because sure. yeah. um, otherwise we shouldn't exist, right? I mean, that's, that's again, we need to, we need to be comfortable with risk and continuously challenge ourselves too, yeah. to lean into those sectors that aren't yet proven, while also keeping our due diligence and our controls, mm-hmm. our, our, our um, you know, our baseline, you know, secure. Do you, do you spend any time? Is, is it usually reactive as kind of prospects are coming in and you're vetting them and talking to them and guiding them versus you being a little proactive and kind of targeting companies and recommending that they should apply for for loans and grants? I mean, is it is it a little of that as well? And and as yeah. you think through that, is there is there a foreign component to this? Right, like there's a lot of innovation happening. You know, whether it's Slovakia or Scandinavia, etc. Sure. We're always hearing about companies then coming to the United States. Is is there a bit of a effort there as well to kind of get well it's, folks it's exactly countries yeah. to set up operations it's exactly the right question for my team right because i'm in the outreach and business development yeah. teams our so you know our uh team has been sourced based on the profiles of these you know leading energy executives who either have retired or have decided that they really want to make a difference you know touring climate change and so they've, they've chosen to join the loan program office so the networks that those individuals have have been fantastic, but also the knowledge that they have for where best to engage in the marketplace. Right. So we are putting people out on panels and on webinars and at conferences. I mean, that's that's our job, right? That's our man. Um, because we do want to educate the market on why we exist and how to work best with us. Mm-hmm. 
that can be done, you know, with a, um, you know, a shotgun or a rifle shot, right? Um, but depending on the market, we're really looking to create a pipeline of, of interested applicants and do some of that outreach, but certainly create the connections where we know that they need to be created. Mm -hmm. Our office has also had um, a supporting role, but a meaningful one in the, um, the liftoff reports, liftoff to commercial energy. And uh, this has been led by the um, Office of Technology Tra Transitions, but the um, those um, reports have been developed by sector to really look at how do we get to commercialization. And they've been um, built around active industry engagement to mm -hmm. identify the, stat the state of the industry, what are the barriers to commercialization, what are the key considerations, what are the investments needed, and they've been designed around, um, you know, these sort of uh, this vision of, look, we need to get to trillion dollars of investment. You know, as yeah. I said, I mean, uh, uh, maybe earlier uh, before we went on, the um, offshore wind is a great example of this, where 10 years ago, we may have made uh, an investment of a billion dollars and a trillion dollars of investment has followed, right? Or, mm. or the numbers get so big, you know, they <laughs> throw them around from... But, but the point is, we are, uh, as a department, thinking critically around each of these sectors and closing the gap on how we get to, re mm. you know, to reach our decarbonization goals by 2030 and, and 2050. And some estimates that I've seen have shown that what we actually need to get there is about $300 billion of investment each year. Yeah. Each year. And that money doesn't come from the Department yeah. of Energy. Right. I mean, we will plant some seeds along the way, but yeah. energy transition means commercially led. Right. And so any actual trans transformation of our economy has to be, um, you know, private sector led. And our office just enables that leadership. Sure. And so how we engage and how we reach those decision makers, how we reach those innovators mm -hmm. um, is our challenge. Right. It's a it's a filtering job because we've. Yeah so many people who can put together a billion dollar deal um but where we can succeed it'll have an outsized impact and yeah. it's worth worth the, the the you know the effort to make that investment when we, when we created this series part of the thesis was kind of conversations in the venn diagram where it was the public sector private and kind of non-profit yeah. education and i feel like your office is that kind of venn diagram right it, it, it's this kind of government being the bridge to bankability then handing it off to kind of commercialization with the private sector. But there's a huge kind of underlying component here with the partnership with educational institutions, with states and county. Yeah. And like, I think that that's kind of a, another aspect of this that doesn't get enough attention is, is the incredible work of these like local counties, because some of these disadvantaged communities are going to fall in kind of areas that maybe haven't had a lot of this attention in the past. And just how important is it to have those partners on the ground? Because if you're a company setting up an operation, I mean, finding the talent, having the comfort that the, technical community college or the university is going to be a resource there. Like, I mean, I, I imagine that that component is, is so fundamental to this, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and I didn't mention this, but it's important to mention, we do have a, um, a really um, um, all-star team in our state energy finance institutions outreach program, yeah. where one of our authorities actually, uh, where there has been a, a meaningful investment by a state, you know, um, you know energy green bank uh where, where where the states are making those investments we've actually streamlined our compliance requirements to get more money behind those investments and to get those off the ground because we know that that impact that we can have at the local level is so important and to your point and again i think this is through those community jobs and justice requirements we are seeing because of how we've structured the application requirements a higher level of engagement with yeah at those, you know, uh, worker training programs at the community, uh, you know, college level and, and at the local level and the commitments made uh, to to labor and to actually, you know, being mindful of the, the responsibility that all of our, our um, applicants have to not just their, you know, making money for their shareholders, but also 
to being a good neighbor and to making the yeah. bringing everyone along with the energy transition. So as you're looking through the rest of this calendar year and kind of stepping on the gas and looking to deploy uh, as much as you can, what roadblocks are you kind of seeing or, or worried about? I mean, you know, on the ground, sometimes it feels like the utility conversation could be a challenge. The talent conversation could be a challenge. Supply yeah. chain comes up, real estate hurdles, NEPA, other right. issues, right? What are the roadblocks that kind of slow down this kind of velocity? It seems like you and your team, it's all hands <laughs> on deck, but things come up, right? Like, what are you worried yeah. about? What are you trying to, to mitigate? Well, first of all, I, I have to maybe correct you. We don't step on the gas. You know, we step on the accelerator, right? <laughs> okay, the accelerator, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but no, I tell you, the real, <laughs> yeah. the real opportunity that I see this year is what I mentioned a minute ago, is that we've created this really substantial interest in the program. And we're, I think we'll continue to see that interest. And I would not yet say we're oversubscribed, truly, because yeah. just because we have had the interest doesn't mean that all of those uh, applicants will get loans, right? We want them to get loans, but only if they qualify. Sure. And so our challenge and our opportunity this year is how to pivot, particularly in the outreach and business development side, from just focusing on the outreach to really the business development piece, which is, okay, now let's make sure that these applicants succeed and let's make sure they understand their requirements and let's get them to a state of quality in their applications so that as we hand that over to our technical team or to our origination team, that they see that, that quality also is there and that they're that they're as as enthusiastic a sponsor as, as we as we want them to be, right? That, that we that we all collectively see that there's a path to um to, to achieving the results that that we aspire to. Now, not all of the applicants will make it, right? I mean, our due diligence process is a strict one and yeah. we Totally upfront with folks about that. We don't turn away applicants, um, but it's our job really to advise them on the requirements and the standards that we'll hold them to and to let them know, you know, like we want them to succeed, but only if they're ready to succeed. Sure. And so it's a, it's a, it's really, a, like I said, it's an incredibly yeah. exciting uh, place to sort of join when this kind of momentum has been created and right. just the opportunity that we have that inspires, I know, everyone on the team to come in and feel like they can give their very best to to getting this job done. Well, look, before I let you go, I mean, how fun must it be to see these amazing innovators and technologies? I mean, some stuff that we've, in the public, probably don't even know about yet, right? I mean, yeah, well, ab absolutely. Abs you know, as particularly as a non-scientist, I mean, coming in <laughs> and just being able to learn uh, all of the really cool things that yeah that Americans are up to and that it's um, it reinforces so many of the, of what you really want to, to believe about this economy and the strength behind it and what, what uh, the opportunities are. I mean, I've heard Jigger say this and I, 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 it's, it's so true. I mean, the technology exists today yeah. to get to zero apartment, right? We've just got to connect the right dots. And um, uh, I'm paraphrasing, of course, you said it more in a more articulate way than that, but uh, truly I, I feel like, um, the team that's been built here, the opportunity that we have, the mandate that we carry forward um, is really an exciting one. And I I'm, couldn't I'm, be more optimistic. Oh, that's great. Well, Phil Kangas, thank you so much for being here. Uh, always excited to connect with your office and your team. And, and amazing to see the progress and traction uh, being achieved as this continues to roll out uh, across so many different fronts. So appreciate you being here. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, it's uh, coffeewithken.com. You can catch up on past sessions. Our next conversation is February 8th with Lakeisha Ann Woods, the CEO of the American Institute for Architects. Until then, you can catch us on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, and YouTube. Thanks again. Good to see you, Phil. Thanks.